Paper number four in our series on sprinting biomechanics is uh, another kind of oldie, not as old as the, the 1925 paper, but still uh, old, old on average for the papers that we'll cover in class. This is a, a 1983 paper from Chapman and Caldwell titled Kinetic Limitations of Maximal Sprinting Speed. Um, this is another paper that I have kind of a soft spot for because the second author here, Graham Caldwell, was my doctoral dissertation advisor when I was a grad student. Um, I was not working with him in uh, 1983. I was three years old and was probably watching Transformers or something. So this was work that, uh, uh, that he did in his own PhD when he was a doctoral student himself. Um, this one will give a perspective on what limits uh, maximum human sprinting speed. So kind of conceptually similar to the Wayne et al. study from last time, but it will differ in uh, two, two fundamental components. And uh, the first one there is that the Wayne et al. study, this one from last time, faster top running speeds are achieved with greater ground forces, was explaining um, between subject differences in sprinting speed. So comparing uh, fast sprinters versus not so fast sprinters and, and what biomechanically explains why the faster sprinters are faster. Um, the paper for today, Chapman and Caldwell, is a within subject approach to limits to maximum sprinting speed. So as an individual um, runs at progressively faster speeds up to and including their max sprinting speed, so like on a treadmill progressively speeding up and up and up until you get to your fastest speed, um, what is it that makes that their fastest speed? What biomechanical component of the movement is like being topped out or is, is no longer able to increase or more broadly speaking, no longer able to, to change in some way to, to make you run even faster. Okay. So a within subjects perspective this time versus a between subjects perspective um, last time. Um, other key difference is that the paper from last time, the way ended all paper, focused on the stance phase of uh, sprinting, the portion in time when the foot is on the ground and you got to uh, press the foot into the ground uh, hard enough and with the proper mechanics to generate uh, large enough vertical ground reaction forces to offset gravity over the whole stride. And as you go faster and faster, you spend less and less time with the foot on the ground. So you got to uh, do that faster and faster and, and, and generate that average force um, in, in less and less time if you want to sprint faster and faster. So a stance phase approach uh, to what limits maximum speed. Uh, the paper for today focuses on um, on what they in the paper call the recovery phase of sprinting, um, which is another term for what I've been referring to throughout class as the swing phase of the gait cycle, the portion of the gait cycle when the foot is uh, not on the ground, when the foot is airborne and the, the leg is swinging through the air, which may seem like kind of an odd thing to, to focus on uh, limits to speed, right? Like last time we talked about how sprinting is all about, you know, generating these large uh, ground reaction forces. And in the swing phase, my foot not even touching the ground, don't generate any forces. So how, how can that kinetically limit me in a maximum speed? Um, one thing I want to highlight is that these two papers, uh, this one, the Chapman and Caldwell, and the previous one, the Wayne et al. study, um, are not necessarily in conflict with each other. They don't necessarily uh, disagree. They're not necessarily arguing against each other. Uh, the Wayne et al. study is not saying sprinting speed is limited by the stance phase, swing phase doesn't matter. Um, Chapman and Caldwell is not saying, no, it's swing phase that matters, stance phase doesn't matter. It's just different perspectives on different components or elements of, of the larger movement that play a role in limiting performance in that movement. Um, for something like sprinting, something as complicated as a, a whole body motion like sprinting that involves basically every part of the body and every muscle of the body, it's rarely, if ever, going to be like one single biomechanical thing that explains performance in that sport. It's rarely going to be one thing that is, that is limiting performance broadly um, from a broad range of perspectives uh, in that sport. If it was, then it'd be real easy to, to get everyone faster. We'd understand it a lot better. Um, so think of this not as two papers in conflict, but two different perspectives on what can limit uh, maximum speed. A couple technical elements of this paper I wanted to go over, one kind of simple and one uh, not so simple. Uh, the simple one is that they had just one, one uh, participant in the study. It was a, an international class female sprinter, they called her, uh, filmed while running on a treadmill at five uh, progressively faster speeds from 6.71 uh, meters per second, which, which for an international sprinter is, a, you know, not, not a jogging speed, but is a pretty pedestrian sprinting speed, um, up to what was probably their maximum speed of close to 9.5 meters per second. Um, 9.5 feels, fem uh, sorry, 9.5 meters per second uh, for a female is a very, very fast speed. I don't, I don't know who this was exactly. They say an international class sprinter. I would guess this was probably 
um, a member of, of the Canadian Olympic team. This is a really, really fast uh, sprinting speed. There's not, not a whole lot of people in the world that, that can sprint at a speed like that for any, any amount of time. So th this was a pretty uh, well-trained, uh, talented, accomplished sprinter that, that, that's being studied here. Um, the key, and this, this will introduce the second technical element, um, the key finding is this figure right here, figure one, which shows the uh, maximum amount of uh, mechanical energy, which is primarily kinetic energy, um, in the leg during the swing phase of sprinting um, as this individual was sprinting at progressively faster speeds up to their maximum speed here. So you can see that it's uh, increasing as speed increases and then kind of plateaus as they get to their maximum speed there. Okay. Um, now, what is this, this energy here? What is this total mechanical energy business? Um, the paper is actually kind of sparse on the technical details of how they calculated that. The methods section here is like uh, like two paragraphs long, and they don't give you a whole lot of details on how they calculated that. They actually just refer to, to a uh, previous study here that has all the, uh, the nitty-gritty details on how that's actually calculated. So this might be another study where you read it and you're like, I don't know what's, what's going on here. What, what did they actually do? Um, let me try and explain briefly here what's going on. And we'll do it with a, a video here. Let's see if this is going to work. Are you guys going to be able to see me? Okay, a little bit of sun up there. Sorry, but this should hopefully be clear enough. Um, I wanted to demonstrate this with a, uh, with a softball bat because that's a real clear demonstration of this idea of uh, energy flow throughout the body, which is what they were calculating here. But I couldn't find my bat. I haven't played in about 10 years, so who, who knows where it is. Um, but throwing, like throwing a ball, is another good example. Um, if I wanted to throw a ball as far as I could or as fast as I could, I wouldn't just sit here with my hand and like shot put it, right? I would do the whole wind up thing, right? I would do a much longer and more complicated motion. And what am I doing in that more complicated motion? Let, let, let's even just skip uh, the first part of it here and just freeze it right here. And notice what I'm doing from this part of the motion to this part of the motion and specifically focus on my shoulder joint here, okay? As I move from here to here in the wind-up part of my motion, what's happening to my shoulder here? Well, I'm moving my humerus backwards like that. Humerus is, is upper arm to the engineers in the class. I'm moving my humerus backwards, which is doing what? It's stretching my pectoral muscle, the large muscle of the chest, which is doing two good things mechanically. By stretching it, I'm moving it up to the eccentric part of that force velocity curve where it can produce a lot of force. And I'm also stretching it like a rubber band and putting uh, some, some strain energy in it. Why is that a good thing? Well, the next thing that I'm going to do in the motion is get my humerus going forward. Right? I'm going to contract my pectoral muscles to swing the shoulder forward like that and get the humerus going forward. So the wind up there is helping me by storing some strain energy in that muscle and putting it up on its eccentric curve where it can produce a lot of force and perform a lot of work prior to producing that force and performing that work. Okay, so that's going to help me kind of slingshot my upper arm forward here. Okay. Um, at other phases of the motion there, uh, before that and after that, a similar thing is happening. It's this sequence of motions where before I do a contraction with the joint or a muscle group, I'm stretching it typically, and that stretches that muscle up on its eccentric force velocity curve and stretches it to put some strain energy in that muscle before I contract it and ideally uh, get, get more kinetic energy on the next segment in the chain there. Okay. So that's like when you see um, a proper throwing motion, not that I'm a, a great thrower, but I'm not, not a horrible thrower. That's why when you see a proper throwing motion, it's not like a shot put type action. It's a kind of this whip-like sequence of progressive motions of the parts of the body. Um, the idea there is that with each step in the sequence there, and it's not really like a, it's not like a herky-jerky, like move this, then move this, then move that. It's more kind of a flow. But if you think of it as like a sequence, with each step in the sequence, I'm imparting more and more and more kinetic energy on my, my end effector here on the ball to get it going forward as fast as I can at the end of the motion there and release it with the most kinetic energy. Now this involves uh, ideally a progressive uh, flow of different types of mechanical energy throughout the body while I'm doing that. So storing strain energy in a joint or a segment, 
and then releasing that as kinetic energy or transferring it as kinetic energy along the limb to get a lot of kinetic energy eventually on the ball, at least is the idea. Um, in biomechanics, there's ways with motion capture and force measurement to compute the energy in different joints and different parts of the body throughout a motion like that. And from that, we can track the uh, flow of energy throughout the body or the energy stored in the whole body or the energy in um, a limb, like the total mechanical energy of, of the arm as like a body segment uh, throughout the motion. So that's what's being shown here in figure one is they were computing the total mechanical energy in the leg in the swing phase. And this is the maximum amount of total mechanical energy in the leg in the swing phase. And most of that for something like sprinting is going to be uh, kinetic energy, energy of motion. So as you might kind of expect, um, if most of this is kinetic energy, energy of motion, and I'm sprinting faster and faster, um, I'm swinging the leg faster and faster as my speed increases to the right here. And this involves uh, more and more peak energy stored in the leg or more and more peak mechanical energy in the leg as I go faster and faster. But then it kind of levels off. Okay, now why is it leveling off? Um, the idea that they put forward here in the paper, and let me pull up my photo booth again. Let's see if I can point it so you guys can see my leg and my foot here. Move it a little down further. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Maybe back a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so in the swing phase, I complete my stance phase, and here I'm looking at, at my right leg here. I complete the stance phase, and then I pick the leg up, and now I'm ready for the swing phase. And what do I want to do in the swing phase? Well, it's called the swing phase because it primarily involves picking the leg up and then swinging the leg forward. Okay? But when I swing it forward, I'm not done yet, right? I still have another task. I've got to slow the leg down and position my foot for the next stance phase so that I can put my foot down and get it in the right spot or a good spot at least for doing the action from the paper from last time, the way end at all study, where now my foot's on the ground and now I've got a limited amount of, of time to briefly generate real big vertical forces to support my body weight. Okay, so you can kind of think of these ideas as, as being coupled. I need to swing my leg forward and I want to do it fast because I want to sprint fast. I don't want to spend a lot of time doing this but then I also need to slow it down fast. If it's swinging forward quickly, then I need to arrest that motion quickly. I need to position my foot and my leg properly to get in the right spot to be able to generate a, a large vertical forces when my foot's on the ground. Okay. So as I sprint faster and faster, I'm doing that swinging action faster and faster. You know, at, at an easy jog, I might be doing it like this. And at a max sprint, I might be doing it like this, right? And swinging the leg forward real fast. So how do I arrest the motion of the leg? How do I slow it down? Um, this is primarily going to be kind of a passive thing. So as I swing the leg forward, if I just relax my quadriceps, my leg will kind of fall down like this. But then the position of where my foot is on the ground exactly is real critical. Okay, I want to slow it down and that's and position it in the right spot as it's swinging forward there, and that's primarily going to involve a, a pretty powerful eccentric contraction of the hamstring muscles there to slow that whole leg down, extend my knee, and re, uh, increase the moment of inertia of the whole leg there to get it to not be rotating as fast anymore, and eccentrically firing up the hamstrings there to position the foot in the right spot for the uh, next stance phase. So as I do this faster and faster, I swing the leg forward faster and faster, get more and more kinetic energy in the leg, but then I need to remove that energy. I need to arrest that motion with this pretty powerful eccentric contraction of my hamstrings in order to be able to, to keep doing it, to do another stance phase and another swing phase and another stance phase and another swing phase. So um, the, the perspective here in Chapman and Caldwell on what limits speed is that as I sprint faster and faster, I have less and less time or, or less and less capacity, but just broadly speaking, to arrest that motion, to slow the leg down and remove its kinetic energy with my hamstrings and get ready to position the foot effectively for another stance phase. Okay. Um, this, this eccentric action of the hamstrings is also why, or at least one of the reasons why sprinters get so many hamstring strain injuries. That's uh, by far the most common injury in sprinting. And it's not actually uh, a lot of the time from when the foot is on the ground, it's more 
from the end of the swing phase here when the foot is airborne and the leg is airborne and you have to fire up the hamstrings real hard to get ready for the next uh, stance phase. So long story short here, or just to summarize, uh, what limits sprinting speed from a swing phase perspective is the need to swing the leg forward faster and faster, which means you have more and more kinetic energy to remove from the leg to slow it down and get ready for the stance phase. You have to do that uh, faster and faster and, and remove more and more energy in less and less time. So kind of conceptually similar to the, the paper from last time where you have to generate uh, bigger and bigger average forces in less and less time. Here we have to remove more and more kinetic energy from the leg in less and less time. So both, both kind of uh, uh, rate of force development or kind of kind of power perspectives on what limits speed. You got to do really uh, powerful things, really high force things, really fast. And if you want to get faster and faster, you got to progressively do those things uh, faster and faster. So this is why uh, power and rate of force development is so important in uh, something for, like uh, sprinting. Okay, that is it for today. We will see you next time.